Joan of Arc is a literal saint, the defender of France. From starting out as a peasant in feudal France, she had to battle to even be heard in her own time, and sainthood didn't come her way until just under 500 years after her death. The question is, what did she do to save France from their arch enemy, the English? And why did it take so long for her to become a saint? Let's take a closer look at the life and legacy of Joan of Arc. This is Chinon, where the French royal court is based. Joan of Arc has just arrived. There are whispers about her instantly, mostly because they have no idea who she is and also because she's wearing men's clothing. Everyone in very Catholic France knows that it's a sin for a woman to wear men's clothing. Deuteronomy say so. She'd come to them saying that she had a message for the king, a message from God. She was going to help King Charles VII turn the Hundred Years' War round against his enemy, England. Yeah, yeah, they thought. But then she kept going and wouldn't stop. They can't risk the king's reputation by meeting with a random woman who claims she is the messenger of God. So she sent away to Poitiers, and there some religious scholars question her daily to find out why she believes God has spoken to her. It's known that the devil finds it easy to manipulate women. So over the course of a week, they ask her questions on where she's from, how the visions came to her, and who said what. All to find out if she's really as religious as she says she is. All the while, she keeps telling them she wants to have King Charles coronated in Rem. Wait, King Charles isn't really King Charles yet? Well, that's kind of the heart of this story and why Joan became famous. This was the Hundred Years' War, and France has been at war with England for ages. Almost a hundred. This is one of the not at war times, so they decide to go through a massive civil war between different factions instead. You have two main groups, the Armagnacs and the Burgundians. They're infighting because the king, Charles VI, aka Charles the Beloved, aka our Charles VII's dad, is not fit to rule. He has many health issues. So they have the chance to use him as their puppet. One side controls him, and then another. Things turn bloody when John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, decides to have the Armagnac Louis of Orléans murdered in the street. He's Charles the Beloved's brother. John doesn't even try to hide that he already knew it was happening, and brings his large army to the gates of Paris, just a little flex. As a result, he takes control of Charles the Beloved and the city. But he lives in fear. What if the Armagnacs come for him now? Both sides bring their armies out into the country, ready to make the civil war a proper one. Our King Charles, the prince at this point, joins the Armagnacs, they fight from 1411 to 1413, on and off. John loses control of Paris, because no one there likes him. At this exact moment, Henry V of England smells blood and shows up. He wins at Agincourt, a huge battle that kills a lot of the princes related to Charles the Beloved. Facing being wiped out by the English, the Burgundians and Armagnacs say they have put their differences aside. Our Charles, the future Charles VII, and John the Fearless decide to meet to put their differences aside. Everyone is careful to make sure this will be safe for everyone. John turns up, kneels in front of Charles, and while he's down there, one of Charles's trusted servants buries an axe in his head. The future Charles VII's reputation is destroyed. He allowed this to happen at a moment that France needed to unite against the English. John the Fearless's son, who will become known as Philip the Good, becomes the Duke of Burgundy. With all this chaos, and after sieges and battles lost to the English, Charles the Beloved is forced to name Henry V as the next King of France. This removes our King Charles from the line of succession. Henry also marries King Charles's daughter, Catherine, and they have a baby. Philip the Good aligns with the English. Anything to stop his enemies, the Armagnacs. Charles the Beloved, King of France, dies. Sadly for Henry V and the English, Henry V died a few weeks before the old king. In theory, the King of France is Henry VI. Henry and Catherine's three months old back in England. This gives Charles a way back to becoming king. The English are now threatening to break through from the north, and if they win the siege at Orléans, they would have the whole country open to them. And with that, we should check back in with Joan in Poitiers. The war is looking like a lost cause. King Charles and his closest advisors can see no way of winning it. 
Joan keeps talking about going to Rem and having him crowned king. But that's a non-starter until Orleans is free. Let alone the rest of the path north they would need to get there. So she says, I will win at Orleans. That can be your sign from God. Everyone is surprised. She has no military experience, no training, nothing. But when they think about it, what's the harm? So they order her some armour and give her some troops. She's off to Orléans. Before she arrives, she dictates a letter to the English. She's going to win unless they choose to surrender. Their response? They take the messenger hostage. Meanwhile, Joan and Cover snuck inside Orléans. She's treated like a hero as she trots around the town on a white horse. Now what? Exactly. When the scholars agreed to this test, they simply told the king to give us some armour and men and see how it goes. So he did what he was told. And when they speak to Joan about tactics, she has a much simpler idea. Attack. They must have laughed at themselves. So naive an answer. They stall and wait some more. And then they remember that the king has said he believes she's from God. So they should really listen to her. What the hell, they say. They decide to attack. She's never seen a battle in her life. Probably not even seen death yet. Oh, I forgot to mention, she's only 16. The next day, they have a clear plan. Attack. The obvious thing to do is to attack the Bastille of saint Loup. It's a long, bloody scrap. The English are determined to beat the whore, as they call her. She sees blood and death for the first time too. But eventually, Joan and the French win the battle. She was quiet at that night, but she wasn't looking to run away from the fight that lay ahead, and there was still a lot to do. The taking of the Bastille was important, but the English weren't done yet. She dictates another letter along the lines of the first and asks an archer to fire it into the English camp. She can hear them mocking and insulting her. Clearly, words aren't going to work. A few days later, Joan and co decide it's time to attack. They win again. Bloody hell, everyone must be thinking. Maybe she is from God. You may be wondering what she's doing in all of these battles. She's not fighting. She's there carrying her banner, urging people to attack, very much there to boost everyone's morale. The English were now trapped in the Tourel, a wounded animal. The next day, Joan orders another attack. Again, it's not easy. And then suddenly, Joan is hit near the shoulder with an arrow. She falls down. The French soldiers are looking shocked as the hero might be dead. They are about to retreat for the day. But no. Joan stands back up and orders them to keep attacking. She was very one note, but what an effective note it was. The French start to scale the tower and the English know they are done for. So what happens next? She has just become a hero to many of the French people by beating the English at Orléans. It was a miracle, a sign she had been sent from God. And it took just four days to win. The battle is won, but the war is far from over. Her king needs a coronation, and they also don't control Paris yet. After the main battles at Orléans, the remaining English troops are cooped up in the remaining Bastille towers. Here we find Talbot, Suffolk and Scales, the English commanders. She starts a siege and waits. The English decide it's not worth it and leave Orléans completely. They have well and truly lost. So Talbot and co start a long march north to regroup. They still hold a lot of the route to Rem, the place that Joan is determined to see King Charles crowned in, and there is a long way to go to get there. At the same time, the very clever men who decide such things say that Joan is definitely a messenger from God. People were rushing to congratulate her, write about her. Someone in Bruges wrote to their father in Milan about the maid called Joan, calling her the new Saint Catherine. But Joan isn't interested in fame. She wants to crown her king and get rid of the English. She meets King Charles. He can't believe what she's managed to achieve. Ooh, a rhyme. To get to Rem, Joan needs to beat the English in Myung, Beaugency and Jargo. And they arrive at Jargo. Joan writes them a letter telling them to surrender. Unlike when the English first replied to her at Orléans, now they just say no. Joan and co start using their cannons against the walls and towers. Rumours start to spread amongst their soldiers that John Fastolf is on his way with reinforcements for the English. They're worried. He's killed many Frenchmen before. They want to retreat and decide what to do later. Joan says no. As always, she says they need to attack. She marches them to the walls. Suddenly she's hit with a rock, thrown by the English. She gets back up and says that God is with the French 
her soldiers realize this all feels a bit like Orleon, and so do the defenders in Jargot. Fear spreads amongst the defenders. The French climb the ladders. The Earl of Suffolk is defending on the walls when he is taken prisoner. Joan and co have won. Next up should be Millard. The problem is they can't afford another head on assault, so they decide to attack Beaugency instead. Again, rumors of Fastolf turning up to save the day, but the English spread. He was actually close this time, but due to all the fame and attention Joan was getting, a one-time friend of Charles, who was now effectively a rebel, turns up. He is known as Richemont, and he has loads of men, and that scares Fastolf off. He retreats to Mion. Beaugency surrenders. The defenders are given safe passage to Paris for their good behaviour. So finally, Joan can face up to Fastolf, Scales and Talbot in Mion, the big showdown. They've just missed each other a few times now, and the English need to settle on a plan before she turns up. But they decide Myung isn't worth holding on to, and retreat north themselves. So what does Joan do now? Hunt her enemies down, of course. They aren't under safe passage. The English are in the woods. Fastolf tries a classic English tactic of protecting his archers with stakes in the ground while the archers kill the enemy. This time, though, a deer runs at them, and the chaos gives away their position. In the confusion, Joan attacks. Talbot and Scales are captured, and Fastolf manages to get away. First Orléans, then Jargot, then Beaugency, and now Myung. She's captured two English commanders, all this within seven weeks of her arriving at Orléans. A war that was going nowhere good for the French suddenly has momentum. But all along, Joan's mission from God wasn't to win battles. Those were just bonuses along the way. Her goal is to get the king coronated in Rennes and get the English out of France once and for all. But it's still a risky trip. The English control the area around it. His other councillors and commanders want him to forget that idea and to attack the English in Normandy instead. He'll lead the army north to Rem. They find some towns, such as Auxerre, are feeling scared and choose to let them in, but not Troyes. This is where the treaty had been signed that disinherited Charles and made Henry V's successor to his dad. And so the town had no intention of giving up their loyalties to the English. Instead, they start to defend. Day one of the attack blends into day two. Those defending the town realize that Joan and the King's forces are bigger than they imagined. They hear nothing from Bedford. It's clear he isn't turning up. However, Joan's army is running out of food and artillery. The town is well defended. Can they win? Most think not, and think they should go back to safety and food. Guess who doesn't like this option? Yep, Joan. No money, food, or artillery. Irrelevant. Who needs such trivial things when God is on your side? She'd have the king in the town inside three days, she says. Now the king's counsellors had a dilemma. Go home to safety or follow Joan at high risk. But if they went home, why had they followed her in the first place? Their decision was already made. They followed Joan. And wouldn't you know it, just her preparing to attack did its job. The town surrenders. The next town along surrenders. They are so close to Rem. What will the town do? They send some noblemen of the town and kneel before the king. And Charles was in Rem that same day. And on the 17th of July, seven years after his dad had died, Charles VII was crowned in Rem. The first part of Joan's mission was complete. So what should they do after this whirlwind journey? Maybe everyone can just chill for a bit. There's a civil war with the Burgundians under Philip the Good to sort out, and a little war with England to win. What Joan should do next is one of the big questions. What do you do with the sign from God that's given you basically everything you hoped for? Charles gives her some little tasks to do, but strangely, he decides to start distancing himself from Joan a bit. Oh wait, England and Burgundy still control a little city called Paris, only one of the biggest cities in the world at the time, and the capital of France. It won't be easy. During the Civil War, no one has taken Paris militarily. So how does Joan handle the fact that no one has taken Paris so far? She attacks, naturally, charges straight for the moat, and she outnumbers the defenders three to one. So they go for it. And then suddenly, Joan is hit in the thigh by a crossbow bolt. Her and her army have seen this before. Shall we back up in a minute, leading the charge? But this time, she doesn't get back up. The siege of Paris has failed. 
And after this letdown, Jonah's lost some of her mystique. Remember the Burgundians under Philip the Good? He's still allied with the English and has been close to the region of France Bedford. But Philip has agreed to a truce with Charles and the Armagnacs. This means Joan is out of action for a while. Meanwhile, the boy king, Henry VI, has been crowned as King of England at the age of eight. And now his uncle Bedford wants to bring him for his French coronation. Ideally at Rem, but as we know, that's a non-starter now that Charles controls it. Along with Henry, the English will be sending their biggest army since his daddy, Henry V, invaded. While they wait for the English and their so-called king to arrive, she can't fight the Burgundians because of the truce. But there is someone else she can attack. Charles is having issues with a certain warlord called Perine Grassard in La Charité. He obviously sends Joan to deal with him. She isn't keen though. She wants to unite France against the English. It's what she's been trying to do all along. Fighting one of her own is not part of the plan though. Joan and the King's army are lacking in artillery. What to do? Joan and the others decide to ask the surrounding towns to provide supplies. Eventually, Bourges and Orléans, where she is adored, send men and artillery to help them. So Joan and the army settle into the siege. And winter has begun as we're into December 1429. It's a long slog. The winter is brutal. Orléans was won in four days. But here, after a month of suffering, the walls are barely scratched by the artillery. The siege is abandoned. The previously unstoppable Joan is now looking very stoppable. She isn't used to this feeling, the feeling of losing, and she should go to Myung, where the rest of the court is. Instead, she goes to Jargot, where she'd been so successful the previous summer. You'd think there'd be doubts about her now, and there were, but Charles wants to reward her. He makes her and her entire family into nobles. I say this as a reward, but it's also a hint that her military role is done. She disagrees strongly. Her mission is to remove the English from French soil. Nothing less will do, and there's still a lot to do. She eventually makes her way back to Charles and the court. She's feeling helpless. Those in fear around the country send her letters begging for help. But someone who isn't feeling helpless is our friend Philip the Good. He's onto his third marriage, this time to a Portuguese princess. He's moving up in the world. Not just a French duke anymore. And his friend Bedford is getting worried. All of those truces and meetings with the Armagnacs are looking sus. Clearly, Charles is trying to woo Philip and the Burgundians back to his side. So Bedford decides to give him more land. He's now also the Count of Champagne, which just happens to be where Rem is. And six months have passed since the Siege of Paris. Joan is getting bored, again. But she's given a small group who move around the country, attacking the English where they can, and sometimes getting close to the gates of Paris. In theory, she should be fighting against Philip the Good's Burgundian army, but they are nowhere to be seen. Instead, they are in Compen. Like many other towns, they defected from the Burgundians and English and instantly became loyal to Charles after he was crowned and was clearly winning every siege. The truce meant that Compen should have gone back to Philip, but the people there don't want it to. Philip isn't taking that lying down. He sieges it. It's a hard siege. But he doesn't care. He wants it. Meanwhile, further north in Calais, King Henry has arrived in France for his coronation, along with dukes and earls galore. The truces were never strictly observed anyway, but they expired a week before, so they have to wait in Calais. The fact that Philip is being so aggressive means Charles has given up on peace with him, so he sends Joan and her roaming band to help the defenders. She can't believe her luck. To add to this, the omens look promising. They are the defenders, just like at Orléans. There is a river that makes attacking it hard. Joan and the group decide to use the river to get in position behind the Burgundians and attack them when they least expect it. The only issue is that this is only recently conquered land and the people are scared of the Burgundians and so won't help Joan. They change their plan and instead go to get reinforcements before heading back to Compen. The siege is getting worse for the defenders. She knows this is the time to attack. They ride out to fight the Burgundians and push them back. They go further back and then she senses something isn't right. She turns around and realises what? The English and Burgundians had hidden a reserve group that wasn't in the initial battle. They now have her surrounded. Joan is screaming at her men to have faith in God. She'll have to fight her way to safety. They surround her and get closer and closer until the Burgundians capture her. Philip the Good goes to meet her but we have no record of what was said between the two of them. 
After, he sends out a letter saying that she was a false prophet and it was foolish to have believed her in the first place. As a commander, she holds hope that Charles would pay a ransom for her as she was a military figure. But the Burgundians dismiss that. She was just an 18-year-old girl who had lied about being a messenger of God. Then Charles and the Armagnacs sent out letters of their own. They throw Joan under the bus. She was too willful and not willing to listen to advice. Coincidentally, Charles has a new messenger from God. A young boy. This young boy announces that she could only have been captured if she had gone against God. From the start of her journey, she had been asked to prove her holiness, initially just so she could be involved. But now the question came back with a lot more seriousness. Her life from now on depends on it. We've already seen some religious scholars at the start of Joan's journey. This time, a different set are back. They are French-English scholars, those that have lived in the English-controlled parts of France for over 10 years now. They demand that Philip hands her over so they can determine if she's committed heresy. But Philip and his lords want a ransom. She was invaluable. How is Joan doing amongst all of this? Not great, but she's still full of fight. She tries to escape once, so they move her somewhere more secure. There, she jumps out of her cell and is badly injured. They become worried she'll kill herself, and then they can't get a ransom. So a compromise is agreed. The English will pay for her, and then they could hand her over to Bishop Gauchon to try her. Whilst all this is happening, things are finally safe enough for King Henry to make his way from Calais to Rouen, the stronghold of English power. And Rouen is where Joan will go on trial. First, there are actually two trials. Let's look at the first one. What exactly are they trying to prove she is guilty of? They could claim treason for going against King Henry VI for the English and French crown. Treason would set a bad example of what would happen if others who supported Charles over Henry were captured, when in reality the English wanted them to defect back to them. So they go for heresy instead. Another big question from our point of view is if we can trust the trial and the people judging Joan. Technically, it was an illegal trial. Illegal because a heresy trial requires the accused to be there willingly. Joan has no choice and is never given the chance to leave. But it's actually a genius strategy from the English. If you convict Joan of heresy in front of a Catholic court, then by extension you've made King Charles VI illegitimate to the people that support him. Also, bear in mind they are loyal to English France, who have hated Joan from the first time they even heard of her, let alone the amount of time she defeated them in battle. And it would be so easy to dismiss the motives of Bishop Cachon as someone who would do anything to convict Joan and have her executed. But as Helen Castor says, the trial was a chance to save a soul and a life, as well as vindicate the kingdom to which he, Calchon, had devoted his career. But first things first, Calchon and his fellow judges are determined to get poor, uneducated Joan to confess to heresy. It should be easy after all. They question Joan repeatedly, asking where she grew up, what her life was like before she saw the visions. They ask about a fairy tree that she played around as a child. Why did she refuse to marry a local boy when she was younger? Who speaks to her? Do these angels physically appear to her? Why does she wear men's clothing? They are trying to get her to say something very specific so that they can prove she is a heretic. But while she might have been uneducated, she was smarter than they thought. She answers in ways that wouldn't incriminate her, at first anyway. But this goes on and on. Loads of questions. Back to herself. Loads more questions. She is against theologians from the University of Paris. They hold all the cards. After a few weeks of this, Joan is exhausted. They've worn down a determined 19-year-old woman. And as she starts to reveal the nature of the angels, they have what they need. They accuse her of 70 crimes. And because that sounds a bit ridiculous, and no one would believe them, they shrink it down to 12 core crimes, and examples include. She compares herself to Christ on the cross. Her signs are physical, a clear sign they are demons. Her hair was unwomanly. Yeah, policing of gender goes way back. She tempted Giles VII, but according to the judges, he wasn't a heretic himself. She admitted to trying to kill herself after she was captured. Ultimately, some of these she was guilty of, e.g. trying to kill herself or wearing men's clothing, which were crimes at the time. Others they can't prove either way, as they don't know the nature of God more than she does. So what do they do with Joan the heretic? The obvious thing is to burn her alive, 
But remember, Kaoshan wants to save her soul, so they offer her a chance to repent, and if she does, she won't die. Faced with the fire, she takes the chance to save herself. Kaoshan has won. Her soul has been saved. But just a few days later, the judges come to see her in her cell, and she's wearing men's clothing again. They tell her that she had promised not to do that in the statement she signed. There's no evidence for this really, but whatever. She says that she was unaware that she wasn't allowed to. Again, Jerry's taken to be burned at the stake. And this time, she doesn't back down. And on the 29th of May, 1431, she was burned to death. Some people claim to have seen miracles as it happened. A few days later, Henry VI is finally crowned as King of France in Rouen. But despite being dead, this was just the first trial of Joan of Arc. 24 years later, when Charles has beaten the English and controls all of France, they have another one. They cancel Joan's sentences. But her reputation sits untouched for 479 years after her death, when she was made a saint in 1920. So Joan was a fascinating figure, who had a bigger effect on the world than anyone could have imagined when she was born. And a surprisingly similar person was someone who lived and died around 100 years before her. Genghis Khan. He was way more interesting than being just a mass murderer. Watch this and see if you agree with me.